Well, I, I, you know, I'm in full agreement with Max Weber, who said that religious religiosity is somewhat like musicality. You, there are people who resonate this sort of understanding of the of of human condition, and and there are people who are deaf tone. It's it's not something you can really, you know, develop. You have it or you don't have it. I'm coming from the killing zone. I'm, I'm, I was born in Budapest. I lived there until I was 35 years old. Every third victim in Auschwitz was Hungarian. So it, it, it's so, in so many ways, I basically felt that um, this is a moment of truth to me. Uh, la later on, I wrote that when Buber finished um, I and Thou, he had a conversation with Agnon. And, and he said that even though he wrote 12 books before I and Thou, he told Agnon that, um, you know, before 40, I, 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 I just did I never start, started thinking. And he was asking Agnon, have you started thinking yet? And so I felt at 19 that I basically intellectually I, I really wasted my time because I wasn't facing reality until now. And once I got to Auschwitz, I felt like, okay, this is it. This is, this is what human condition is. This is the question. This is what you have. If you want to believe in God, if you want to you know, come up with some sort of a way of life, everything's going to be measured against this. To me, it's just, it, it not only didn't make sense, to me, this called everything into question. So basically, I felt that whatever culminated here in Auschwitz could not have started with Hitler only. That this goes back, this is a longer story. And then, I, of course, I started you know, to read about, let's say, the last book of Luther on Jews and their lies, which is to me, it's way worse than Mein Kampf, if you read that book. And then I started, of course, to read Saint uh, Chrysostomus in the fourth century and the way he speaks about Jews. Once I kind of read myself into what preceded the Holocaust, it, 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 I really tried, started to put the puzzles together, you know. And I felt that, that um, First of all, it's not just Holocaust. It's not just part of modernity's legacy. I think the Holocaust bankrupted modernity, and I also believe that if if I were a Christian, I would be, you know, similarly challenged. I think, you know, all the bishops and the priests and the, and, the, and the leaders, if they would have came out right after Kristallnacht, you know, in November 1980. 1938, and if, if they would have said in a unisolo that, you know, we are not Aryans, we are Jews by spirit, this is not okay with us, the whole plan of Hitler would have collapsed. Because, you know, wh wh why did the evil, the wicked succeed and, 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 and prosper while the righteous suffers? It, it, is, it is a huge question, and I have to say, you know, Iluya Dativ Haitiv said Yosef Albo is a medieval philosopher. If, if I would know God, I would be God. I simply don't know his, his uh, secrets. And if I would know his secrets, I wouldn't believe in him. Because why, why would I? So, so Kafka, for example, said, another you know, dear writer of mine, he, he, he said that we were only given the power to speak to God not about God. And, and since God is everywhere, right now even, it would be very weird if I would start to talk in second person, but yes, God, you're here, right? It's very hard um, to um, kind of justify his you know, conduct during those years. So, I mean, there's what is a Jew called Philip Muller, a Czech Jew, and he writes in his book, he walked up to the Nazi guard and he said, shoot me. I just buried my wife. I can't do this no more. And he said, <laughs> you're not going to have that easy. Go back to work. So after trying that way, 
he tried to sneak into the gas chamber and he was standing there fully dressed among the naked. And then the naked Jews pushed him out saying, no, don't do be, don't become a martyr here. Go and breathe, live and let the world know what our fate was here. So a part of committing suicide, there was no any way to resign or refuse from, from this function. And there are saints, true saints, who did commit suicide, and I leave my hat for them. But most of us are not saints, and they just wanted to make sure, hour by hour, that they're not taking the next breath from the gas. What Saul does is not motivated by survival. There is more than survival. He is not doing something for saving his skin. He does something for someone else. And Burying someone is a par excellence human activity. Animals do not bury each other. It's only us who somehow we cannot, it's unbearable for us the distance between living and dead. It's so antisocial to be around the dead person. You can't do anything it's, and it's unbearable. That's why we bury these people. We couldn't, we couldn't go on. It's not just hygienical and whatever reasons, it's, it's psychological as well. We, we have to make them disappear. They are too threatening for us, the dead people. So I think that speaks beautifully about something extremely spiritual of, of Saul's recognition. But when, when he saw this boy who survives the gas chamber, and by doing that beats the system because nobody meant to survive. Any and every survival was due to a systematic error. This boy survives the gas chamber. And maybe they locked eyes, who knows what, this is not his biological son for sure, but when two people meet, no matter how shortly, it's kind of like love or friendship, when two people meet, anything can happen. That's the beauty, that's called relationship. And so he adopts this boy. And from that time on, his pursue is to bury this one. He can't bury them all, but he's gonna bury this one. It's his job, it's his purpose from now on. That's what keeps him alive. And that smile at the end of the movie, to me, testifies that the only person who is happy in this movie is Saul. Primo Levi, the Italian thinker, wrote once, even the words did not mean what they generally mean. He says, David, you and I, if we skip a meal, we're gonna say we are hungry. Primo Levi said, you know what hunger meant in Auschwitz? Is when you look at another human being as something edible, not that was hunger in Auschwitz. You don't know that feeling, hopefully. I don't know for sure. So since the reality was so different, we had to gap, they have to bridge this gap between our everyday lives and the, and the planet Auschwitz. We have to get there. And so that required to forge a new cinematic language, you know, to do that. I just uh, spoke with the, um, the president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, who's a great German, and he, he feels very, you know, it is very uh, important for him the, uh, that the younger generations in Germany or in Europe generally, they, are, they feel less connected to the Holocaust. And, and we, were we were trying to figure out why is that? Because his generation, whose fathers and grandfathers were involved, they are still very linked to it. But the younger generations, they go to Auschwitz and they do selfies. They, they, they chewing gum, they listen to music. They're not so, why is that? And I told him, which he agreed with, it's not a lack of knowledge. These kids don't deny it happened. They all know this six million, they all know it's gas. But they don't feel it. And so a survivor told us that he thinks it's more beneficial to see our movie, which is 100 minutes, than to go and fly to Poland and take a hotel and take the, show the kids to this very the tourist attraction, sort of a museum. Because the real question is, again, how can you convey the experience of the Holocaust? It's, it's, it's not about knowledge, it's not information. You have to feel, you have to be able to put yourself into their shoes. I come back to you, um, anti-authoritarian musician, 
poet, novelist, uh, now actor. Yeah. What is it that holds all those different parts of you together? What are you, uh, what are you here to do? Well, you know, I mean, I, I have developed over the years. I, I wouldn't say, of course, that I'm, I'm the same when I was 16 and had the blue hair and had a punk band. You know, I have my own journey, I have my own upbringing, I have my own challenges. But, um, you know, my skin certainly is not the one that holds me together. I think deep down there must be some sort of a core value that, that I am after. It's, it's, I, my question is, it comes down to, for example, if in Auschwitz, I always ask myself, what would I have done? Why is that one person conducted himself or herself commendably in the camp, and the other one became like a thief or, or, or a violent or, or some sort of thing? My grandfather, every Thursday night, had survivors come over and play cards in the living room. And I always listened to them. Even from my bed, I could hear their conversation. And they were talking about X, Y, and Z and saying they would never invite him to play cards here because he was behaving terribly. And I kept asking my grandfather, what was he doing? So that's, that's the, to me, to me, every single moment of, the, of life has the same importance. There's no such thing to me as red carpet. Every moment is red carpet. There's no, there, there are no real more important things. When I'm talking to you, that's what I was put on earth to do right now, to talk with you. Even if I'm lost in the city, got off to the wrong stop on the subway, that's where I have to be. There is a reason for that. So I always try to make myself into the present. If it takes a punk band at the time, felt like that's the, that's the thing because I hated the communists. I still do. That wasn't the place to live at. I wanted them to go away, and I, I did. I, you know, I did what I could. Right now, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I write poems if I can. I just want to, you know, to to be to be used. I mean, I have my skills. I have my talents. We all do, and I just want to make sure that. You know, I, I'm not living in a self-gratifying way. And your hopes for the film, what do you hope that it will achieve? I think the film is, ha has its own life. It's way ex exceeded, I think, our expectations. This is a low-budget Hungarian movie. And um, millions and millions of people saw because of the recognition of, of different awards and, and so forth. I think we are very blessed. You know, I don't believe generally that art history is fair and it picks the, the only the great, you know, works. I think there are plenty of fantastic movies and books that somehow just fell on the side and never really got into the center. So we, we feel very, very blessed. And I think what we would like to, um, you know, to achieve is just to, um, to, it's an appeal. We, we, we wanted to remind the viewer that 71 years after, you know, let's, let's face it. I don't think history turned the page. I think uh, genocide is a permanent possibility. It might be, you know, in another, another continent, in a diff different method. But I don't think the standards of human behavior you know, raised to, an, to a higher level than 71 years ago. I think personally that we are heading towards chaos. I'm scared, I'm the father of four. And I thought the bloodiest possible centuries just behind us, the 21st, must be much better. Well, 15 years into the 21st, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem very promising.